Welcome to the recorded version of the Grant Makers and Aging Web Seminar, Intergenerational Solutions for Building Stronger Communities, featuring Donna Butts, Executive Director at Generations United, Kathy Choi, Director of Programs at the Eisner Foundation, Ellen Schmetting, Director of Aging and Independence Services and Public Administrator for the San Diego County, and Maria Gonzalez-Jackson, Director of Programs and Membership at Grant Makers and Aging. From October 14th, 2015, this event was made possible by a partnership between Grantmakers and Aging and the John A. Hartford Foundation. Technical and production support is provided by the American Society in Aging. At this point in time, I would like to welcome Maria Gonzalez-Jackson from Grantmakers and Aging, who is going to guide us through the presentation. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today for our series on conversations with GIA. Uh, today's session is Intergenerational Solutions for Building Stronger Communities. My name is Maria Gonzalez-Jackson, and I'm the Director of Programs and Membership here at Grantmakers in Aging. I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us here today. Before we begin, we want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation for their support as well as American Society for Aging for their technical support for today's webinar. Most communities are multi-generational in their makeup, meaning they have members of all generations, but most are not intentional in their efforts to bridge the generations. Our speakers today will be sharing how intergenerational policies, practices, and programs can transform communities into age-advantaged neighborhoods that yield great outcomes for both young and, old, young and older adults. With us today are Donna Butts, Executive Director of Generations United, Kathy Choi, Director of Programs at the Eisner Foundation, and Ellen Schmetting, Director of Aging and Independent Services, Public Administrator for San Diego County. Welcome to all of you. Donna, let's start with you this afternoon. Please tell us how Generations United has created intergenerational solutions. Well, Maria, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today, and I'm just delighted that Ellen and Kathy um, have agreed to join us because I think they both have incredible perspectives, wisdom, and experience to share with everybody. So we're just delighted to have this opportunity and really appreciate Grantmakers and Aging making it possible. Today, um, you'll see on the next slide, the agenda that we intend to cover on the next slide, yes, is the, the agenda is I'll be covering what are intergenerational solutions, moving from connection to community, uh, and improved outcomes for all ages and communities. Kathy and Ellen will be touching on those, but in addition, what Ellen is going to talk about is the San Diego County story, which I think is um, incredibly inspiring, absolutely wonderful to hear about how the work has developed and evolved and really helped San Diego County become a, a, a leading intergenerational um, shining star in the country. And then Kathy is going to be able to share the grantmaker's perspective about why intergenerational advantages are good for grantmakers and the, the Eisner Foundation story. So I think there's a real richness that's going to be uh, available and then available for the Q&A later on today. I'm also fortunate to have Sherry and Emily from Generations United with me uh, because they're going to be helping with questions and answers. So why don't we go ahead and jump into the next slide. What are intergenerational solutions? Well, really, intergenerational solutions are engage two or more generations. Um, it's not a single age perspective. It's really using an intergenerational lens to look at any op opportunity or possibility or problem that you may be faced with. And the key is the intergenerational, because many, many people will say, oh, we are intergenerational, but in fact what they are is multi-generational. And what I mean by that is, and we'll be getting more into some of the, the detail of this, but what I mean is, that oftentimes people have, let's say, a library, and they'll say, we do programming for adults, we do programming for children, we do programming for families, so we're intergenerational. But in fact, unless you're entering, unless you're connecting those generations, it's really a multi-generational approach, which is great, but we think that the win-win-win increases when you actually really focus on that intersection of connecting generations, connecting the strengths, connecting the vitality and the wisdom of the generations. And one tool that can help you with that 
is the intergenerational engagement scale. And when we share resources with you at the end of this webinar, one of our publications has a scale that you can use, your grantees can use, your program officers can use, that really help people to see, to weigh along the continuum where they are as far as the level of intergenerational engagement that that intervention is, is developing. And it's really meant to help people think, evaluate, and really thoughtfully increase um, their intergenerational engagement. But on to the next slide, which is why should you care? Why should you care about intergenerational engagement? Well, one thing that we say often is that it saves money while making sense. And I think a great example of that is a story that we just were reading about this week, 10 years later, looking back at the Swampscott High School and Senior Center, which was built in Swampscott, Massachusetts. The county or the community came together when they needed to replace their senior center and their high school and they created the Swampscott High School and Senior Center. Now, 10 years later, they're still seeing tremendous results, tremendous connection between the generation, and it's saving their community money. They didn't have to build two facilities. They could share the gym. They could share the dance studio. They could share the space, which really, really has helped their community be able to reach and meet the needs of multiple generations in their communities. So it's really an economy of scope. And by that economy of scope, what we mean is it's a single intervention that impacts multiple generations. Rather than doing single, one-shot solutions, it really impacts and has a much broader scope. So you're actually creating a win-win-win, a win for young people, a win for young people, for old people, for communities, and for all of us, because it weaves a much stronger society, a much stronger social compact. I think another great example of how uh, someone has used this economy of scope, is a program that was piloted in Michigan called Driving Away Hunger. And that program really had people thinking outside the box because what they did was a young woman, 16, who was learning how to drive, she and her mother were driving around during the gas shortages and when high prices for gas, needing to get the, the miles behind the wheel so she could get her driver's ed, get her license. And they, they thought, what an waste of money, a waste of time it is to do this. And so they thought, what if? So they went and they met with the Meals on Wheels in their local community, and they said, what if we combine Meals on Wheels and driver's education so that the young people would be delivering the meals to homebound older adults, they'd be getting the miles they needed behind the wheel, their parents would be with them, they'd be learning about the importance of volunteerism, and the parents would also be getting a tax break because the mileage would be deductible because they're volunteering. So again, it's a win, 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 but it's only the kind of thing that we think of when we're thinking outside the box and we're using that intergenerational lens. So it really makes sense, and as the next slide so shows, it really makes sense because I think somebody who said it really, really well was John Legend and Common in the Oscar-winning and Grammy-winning song from the movie Selma when they said, no one can win the war individually. It takes the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. And I really think that that's where we are in our society. It's that wisdom of our elders and the energy of young people. When we connect that, we come up with vibrant solutions for our communities. So let's go to the next slide and dig, dig, deep, dig deeper into what are the characteristics of high quality intergenerational interventions. Well, one, they're intentional. There are so many times somebody has come up to me and said, I didn't realize I was doing an intergenerational program. And I have to admit, and maybe um, this isn't the right response, but I almost always say, really? Then you probably aren't. And the reason is because if you're not being intentional about it, if it's it's, you're not being thoughtful. You're not really probably engaging the generations to the degree that you really can. They need to be intentional, not incidental. They're, they're meant to be in the forefront and not a garnish or an afterthought. You need to intentionally be thinking about how to include the generations in planning, how to make sure that there's true leadership among the generations, and that there is, are equal numbers of older and younger. Sometimes people think they have an intergenerational task force because they have one 16-year-old on the task force. It's not intergenerational. So I think a gr an example of it that always comes to mind is a site that we worked with where we were providing tech technical assistance, and it was a multi-generational recreation facility, and the seniors were planning a, a technology program um, to engage young people. They met weekly planning a technology program, and then they went over to the high school and asked the young people if they wanted to come over to the senior center and join them. Well, 
they didn't. They didn't because they weren't a part of planning, they weren't a part of the visioning, they didn't work together. And sometimes that planning, that process is actually the program because they learn together, they plan together, and uh, get to know each other. So remember, intentional is really important. And as the next slide says, another thing that's incredibly important is the fact that we re realize that they're reciprocal. Oftentimes people will say, oh, older adults have so much to give, or younger people have so much to, to, to teach. But in fact, both generations benefit. Neither one is in a, a necessarily a, a lesser role. There's the receiving and the giving across the lifespan. But they're really, uh, it's, a, it's a reciprocal relationship. And there's some wonderful, wonderful um, examples of that. I think one I love is the Geriatric Career Development Program in New York. That's a program that's been around for over 10 years. It's been evaluated, and it's really amazing. What that program does is it takes young people, high school students, oftentimes they um, have had run-ins with the law or they may be on the verge of dropping out. They're recruited for this program um, by the Jewish Home Life Facility. Uh, they join it for two years, and they learn about being health care providers, whether it's in-home aides, whether it's uh, pharmacists, whether it's physician's assistants, doctors, lab technicians, they learn about the, the health profession. And at the same time, those courses take place at the, the, the Jewish home. They select a mentor among one of the residents, and they work with the residents. They, they are in classes. They work with the residents. They develop these incredible um, relationships. And many of them, actually the majority, have gone on to graduate and to pursue a career in health. So they may be there to learn, but they're actually also teaching. They may, the, the older adults may be there receiving care, but they're actually the ones who are giving the support and care that young people need. So it's that reciprocity. And then as the next slide shows, um, really it, intergenerational work values the contributions and the strengths of each generation, understanding that each generation has something to give. So, for example, in Bridge Meadows, which is a, a planned community in Portland, it's one, there are several like it in, in the country, but basically it's foster and adoptive families who live side by side with older low-income adults. The older adults get a reduced rent in agreement to uh, volunteer and help support the families. So they feel connected, they feel like they've got a purpose, and it really helps the families um, and provides that other caring adult for the, the young people as they're growing up. There are other examples like Derotes in New York and their friendly visiting program where young people will deliver meals, they'll take oral histories, they'll work with older adults. Oftentimes that's a family volunteering program as well. So as we go to the next slide, why is this more important now than ever before? It's really important that we move from silos to solidarity. We really have age segregated our society through the programs, the policies um, that we have initiated. And it's really, uh, I think, even more critical than ever to realize that our country is facing a changing age and race demographic. So at this point, about 50% of people under the age of five are of color, but less than one in five people over the age of 65 are in color, of color. So why should they care about each other if they've never seen each other, met each other, if they don't go to the same facilities, if they don't see each other and, and connect on the streets? Why is it that they should care about investing in each other? So as we have this growing, incredible, changing demographic, it's ripe for intergenerational solutions and intergenerational connections. So as the next slide shows, it's really urgent that we move from traditional intergenerational programs, which were just focused on connecting individuals, to in, engaging and involving an entire community. It's, and what that does is then help to shift the conver conversation from the burden of an aging population to the benefit of an aging population, shifting from burden to benefit. And as the next slide shows, what we tried to do uh, this year is we created an a, a infographic to try to make the case for why intergenerational connections were important and make the case that we really are stronger together. So we laid out the changing demographics, the cost argument, what it means if we capitalize all of our assets and what it means if we're, if we're mixing things up. And this infographic is also available in some of the resources that you'll see at the end of the webinar. So we, we hope that you'll take it and use it, help to make the case for why this is important. 
one of the things that we have gone on to do, and we'll see that in the next slide, is that we're really, really uh, pleased that the MetLife Foundation for the last five years has helped us in honoring the best intergenerational communities in the country. And as grantmakers and aging members know, intergenerational communities, best communities for all ages, are good places to grow up and grow old. So with this award program, which we hope you'll consider in your community or you'll share in your community, um, people go through an application process. It's really a learning experience to find out how their uh, community is doing when it comes to their intergenerational quota. Um, the next round of applications is due in on January 15th. Uh, those are reviewed by an outside expert panel, which Scrapmakers and Agent has been a part of for several years. And as you go to the next slide, what happens then once the reviewers have reviewed is that we name the top communities in the country, and as well as we oftentimes will have national finalists. So what you see here is a map of the award-winning communities as well as the four national finalists that have been recognized over the last five years. The finalists are ones, communities that are, are working really hard to become intergenerational models, and they've made a great deal of progress, but there's still a little bit more that they could do to get over the finish line. So we try to encourage those communities. Now, in the next slide, what you'll find are, is that these communities involve families of all sizes and types and shapes. They involve families of all ages. They involve people of all income levels. And that includes one of our communities was Carlisle, Massachusetts, which has a median household income of $160,000 a year. And on the next slide, you'll see one of the other communities, which is one of our lower income communities, which is Itabina, Mississippi. Um, some of you may know Itabina because that's where B.B. King was from. Um, but but Itabina has an average household income of slightly less than $20,000 a year. And here you'll see Mayor Thelma Collins, who came up with some members of the community to accept their award, um, because what we do is an award celebration in Washington, D.C. The communities receive flags. They receive road signs that they can display back home. They get an emblem that they can put on their websites, including funding requests. Um, but ways that can help the community leverage the fact that they're a best intergenerational community. And what Mayor Collins said about the award was, the award helped our community see we're moving in the right direction towards a healthier community for all ages. We increased the number of people in our health screenings, and a new mayor's health council was formed. We were recognized by the Obama administration and received one of 26 technical assistance grants to help us get a grocery store. We're on our way to, be, to getting fresh fruits and vegetables to our town. They felt like they were empowered. They felt like they could make a difference. And they're finally going to get a grocery store, which is really very, very cool. So Itabina was one of the communities. Now what happens, if you go to the next slide, is we bring people to uh, Washington, D.C. to receive their awards. And their members of Congress are thrilled that their, their constituents are being recognized. So they meet with uh, with the representatives from the community. So here you have Senator Warren meeting with the representatives of Carlisle, Massachusetts, and some of the Generations United staff. And on the next staff, or excuse me, the next slide, um, what you'll find is that the, the members of Congress are actually so thrilled that they'll actually walk across the hill to the other side of the hill, House members going to the Senate side, Senate, Senate members going to the House side, so they can meet with their communities. Now the great thing, and in the next slide we'll talk about this too, is that the communities also get to meet with each other, and we build these incredible connections between, uh, between the communities so that they can learn from each other. Um, it's really inspiring. What we hear from them is that they start to, we have this network that starts to um, ask each other's other questions. They find out about an intergenerational task force, how to put that together. Do you have a job description that we could borrow and maybe embellish for our community? What are the program details of that poetry contest you mentioned? And much, much more. But next slide. Um, what I really like is that almost all of them report that they're much more intentional in their work in the intergenerational area. But one of the things that's inspiring is that it also connects the leaders in those communities, not just across communities, but across age groups. And here from last year, you have our oldest and our youngest speaker. At that time, Bob Simon was 99 and our colleague from Wisconsin was 16. But I think Amy St. Peter from Maricopa County said it so well in terms of what this means for the communities when she said, the award honored the work done or underway, but it also upped the ante for us. 
we push ourselves to earn the, the award all over again every day. So it's an inspiring way when we encourage communities and encourage people in their intergenerational work. So next slide. How do you begin? How do you start to use intergenerational solutions? One thing that's really important is that, to realize that everyone has a role and that everybody needs to take a bite, whether it's community leaders, schools, businesses and chambers of Congress, youth organizations, aging services, and policymakers, as well as grant makers, can really make a difference in this. And how it translates into policy can be really fascinating. Next slide, please. It really means weaving the generations. So a couple of examples. In one community, whenever anybody wants to use a facility that com the community owns, they've added an extra line to the, to the application. It's how many generations are going to be involved in the activity. We've heard from funders who've added that line to their applications. Are you going to be engaging more than one generation? Have you thought about using, engaging more than one generation? Communities who have, a, have decided to elect intergenerational commissions to really look at community issues and opportunities have really been able to make an impact in those communities. I think that one of the great examples you're going to be hearing from her shortly is the Eisner Foundation, which has taken this very seriously and taken it to a scale that we've never seen a foundation take it to before. They have an incredible opportunity in L.A. County to turn it into a community and a county that really does engage all ages. So there's tremendous leadership that the philanthropic community can play in making sure that we are building inclusive communities that value people of all ages, that help everyone to feel like they have a role, that they're a participant, that they are indeed valued in that community. So I think as the next slide shows, I think that this is so very important because as we're getting closer to Margaret Mead's birthday, many of us will always remember that great quote of hers, which is that somehow we have to get older people back close to growing children if we're to restore a sense of community, a knowledge of the past, and a sense of the future. So I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity and Generations United the opportunity to share some of this uh, philosophy, some of our beliefs, and some of what we've been learning and we've been so fortunate to learn from so many of you around the country as you're engaging in this work and taking it to incredible new levels. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for this. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to my valued colleague, Ellen Schmieding, who has done tremendous work in San Diego County so that she can tell you about the successes that they've had there. Thank you. Hi there, this is Ellen Schmieding, and I'm the Director with Aging and Independent Services in San Diego County. And I'll just ask that the slide be advanced. Thank you. And one more, please. I would just like to talk with you a little bit about why we engage every day in our intergenerational programming. What we see is the need to redefine the roles and responsibilities of all of our citizens at every stage of life. And we look for ways, Donna mentioned being intentional in our effort, we really have taken that to heart, looking at problems that we have in our community and looking for programs, policy, and procedures that actually bring generations together to solve these significant problems. Next slide, please. One of the things that we have is a long history of engagement in intergenerational work. We have a biannual aging summit. And back in 2000, one of our topics, we always choose topical areas to focus on, things of significance in the aging community. At that time, we focused on intergenerational work. And our Board of Supervisors was so impressed with what they were hearing. And they had such a tremendous level of support that they authorized us to bring on a position, an actual County of uh, San Diego position that would provide intergenerational coordination. So we had to have had someone since that time whose sole job it is, is to foster, support, and encourage intergenerational activity. And we've had several people in that role. Each one has brought wonderful talents and strengths to the job. Early on, what our director at the time was Pam Smith, now on the Generations United Board, just a real strong advocate 
for intergenerational. She reached out to colleagues in the first five commission. This is an activity in California funded by, the, by um, tax revenue, and it focuses on services for kids zero to five. We worked with them and got a number of intergenerational programs off the ground supporting those kids zero to five, many in preschool and other activities, and we experienced early success. We also worked on the senior mentoring program, and I well remember that opportunity we had to bring older adults to the table to help with those families receiving welfare benefits. Now, in 2012 at our Aging Summit, we, Donna Butts came out, and we had a wonderful opportunity to receive the award of Best IG Communities along with four other entities at that time that helped us build momentum. And we now have a total of five intergenerational coordinator positions in our region. Next slide, please. Here's just a wonderful placemat that was created that talks, that asks for inspiration. What does it mean uh, to participate in intergenerational activities? Here you can see the statement from Annika, like holding the hand of somebody special, I guess. And we had a wonderful time during our Live Well San Diego um, event that year, our summit, and we focused on intergenerational. We had Jumpstart grants that we got going uh, around the county in uh, numerous communities that worked out very, very well and uh, helped to inspire further programs. Next slide, please. And then we went on with our key activities. One of the ones I want to share with you has been so significant for us. We've had uh, a lot of media pay attention to this because of the significance with bringing older adults and foster kids together. We took our inspiration from Hope Meadows, and many of you are very familiar with that important program. It was a, a it is an intergenerational planned community, and it brings foster kids, families, seniors together. Next slide, please. What that did for us was the inspiration of Hope Meadows. We looked at our own developing a residential program. Now, this is for foster teens who have not been adopted. It's not a foster home. It is a high school. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have about 103 individuals that are there right now. And this is an opportunity for these kids to have a lot of camaraderie, learning, and support on campus. They've got the education. They live there. And they're learning job readiness skills. Next slide, please. What we did was to go ahead and bring in the San Pasquale Academy neighbors. These are older adults who live on campus in private homes, and they have a, a very nicely reduced rent. And what they need to do is go ahead and provide services 10 hours a week to the youth. Next slide. We have seen some promising outcomes here, and that has everything to do with the high school graduation rate being extremely high. We have a majority of those kids moving forward to college, and the grandparents are very satisfied with the program. And we've been at it so long, we have a couple different generations of grandparents that have provided assistance. As an aside, I'll tell you that after our significant fires in 2003, we made the decision to rebuild those housing units for older adults because of the success of the program. Next slide, please. Another significant issue we have in our region are those foster kids who age out of care. We have about 75,000 kids in foster care in California, 4,000 are aging out. And I don't have to tell many of you how hard it is to grow up just with all the supports we have uh, from families that are intact. Those foster kids have a number of challenges, and a list is here for you. You can take a look at that. And just know that we wanted to do better. We wanted to provide support for these kids and to help them on their journey. Next slide. 
So we initiated the Workforce Academy for Youth program. This was done within our county of San Diego. These are paid internships for youth, and they teach them life skills, work skills. And what I'd like to share with you now is in the next slide, the role of our life skill coaches. Here's where we said it's not enough to just have job coaching. These kids need to understand what it means to have a job. And so the life skills coaches are older adults who care about the, the youth that they're partnering with, that they're supporting. They provide activities. They, they develop friendships. They listen, they give reinforcement, and you know one of the things they do is just concrete steps like, I think you need to get an alarm clock, set it, and get up on time. Just the basics. Uh, they really provide a listening ear, and they're outside that job environment, so they have additional credibility with those youth. Next slide, please. Our goals with, the, well, with this particular Workforce Academy for Youth, it, you see right here, 80% complete the program. Those that do, our goal is to help them get permanent positions or go on to educational or occupational training and to engage in both of those, employment and education. We've had real success with the program, 180 graduates to date. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that really is significant in our region and across the nation is the obesity epidemic. And this impacts kids to where now there's a worry that young people may be the first generation that actually doesn't live as long as their family members, older family members. So we looked at this issue in our community, and we saw a terrible incidence of overweight or obese, almost 30% of kindergarten kids in our South County area. And this got everybody's attention, and we said, what can we do? What intergenerational efforts can we take? Next slide, please. Now, since 2000, we have hosted the intergenerational games. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, the intergenerational games. You know, this. I was at a games earlier last week, and it was the high point of my week. It's older adults. It's kids coming together. There's an inspirational speaker. There's a half day of fun, sports, games, nutrition. In our region, we're all about healthy eating and exercise, and there's learning about good nutrition. There's exercise that occurs. Next slide, please. And it is a very well-received day. Another response we've taken is the Five and Fit program. One of the things that we've done is to bring older adults to early childhood education centers, preschool centers, to help teach about physical activity. They do gardening together, and they support parents and caregivers so that they have access and understand the importance of healthy, affordable food and the importance of exercise. Many of us know that a lot of important learning occurs in that zero to five time frame. So we're capitalizing on that with the Five and Fit program. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to share with you another effort that we've been involved in. Oh, here's our Five and Fit, just a few other highlights here. We show a little gardening. Uh, we have pulled together a curriculum that's working well, and we hope to expand this program in the coming years with additional funding. Next slide, please. And then finally, I want to share with you our Safe Routes to School program. We were a MetLife uh, livable community site, and we built with our partners from La Mesa the Walk and Roll program, older adults supporting kids walking to school. And I can't say enough about the importance of this program. Over 5,000 students have participated thus far. Next slide, please. I would just like to leave you with a few lessons learned. As Donna mentioned, it. She mentioned a win, win, win. Well, we are really always working to make sure that every generation walks away with an appreciation for the other generations involved as well as some benefits for themselves. We've identified champions in our region. We've gone out of our way to bring our Board of Supervisors and other executives along. We reach out to media to tell the story, and we look for 
partnerships that maybe weren't intact previously. And then one of the secrets in our community is that it's linked back to solve significant issues that we are facing. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, we have a lot going on. We never rest on our laurels. We really, really appreciate participating in today's webinar, and I'll close at this time. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ellen. Uh, before we move on, I'd like to remind everyone that you may submit your questions by typing them in the question box on your screen on the right. At this time, I'd like uh, to um, have Kathy share some of your thoughts with us from the grant maker's perspective on the advantage of intergenerational solutions. Great. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, GIA, for inviting our foundation to be part of this panel. I don't have any PowerPoint slides, but would like to invite everyone to browse through our newly launched website, www.eisnerfoundation.org, while I talk about our decision to become the only foundation in the country solely dedicated to funding intergenerational programs. For nearly 20 years, the Eisner Foundation has supported innovative efforts to help low-income children and older adults in Los Angeles County. We have kept our funding category separate, which is a typical practice of most foundations, and we're proud of the investment we have made for children and senior groups. However, when we visited so many organizations and communities throughout the region, we saw that there were numerous common denominators among these vulnerable populations. And we soon realized society's most daunting challenges require complex solutions involving the participation of all our citizens, not just singular groups working singularly. Therefore, in 2011, we established the Eisner Prize for Intergenerational Excellence in order to find best practices and in intergenerational solutions throughout the country in hopes of replicating them in LA County region. We have since recognized five organizations and eventually decided to focus our entire completed grants through intergenerational programs. This was not an easy task, as it took more than seven months of planning with our board of directors and talking to various stakeholders, as we were known as one of the leading funders in children programming in Los Angeles, especially in early education as well as college access. But we believe that programs combining the strength of each age group will have a multiplying effect, creating longer lasting positive changes in our communities. We also decided to launch a brand new website, which you're looking at right now, and a media campaign um, highlighting some of our social media um, um, outlets around this new direction. Um, as you see on our website, we have described why we have decided to move into this direction um, in, in our FAQ page as well as in our under our research center um, that has various different um, academic materials as well as different um, studies that we found during our planning process. Um, and we also have highlighted some of the key points of why this new solution is important for LA region through an infographic, as you can see. And in terms of our grant making, it has stayed the same in terms of our the way we do our four meetings, which we meet four times a year. Um, we still look at various different similar criteria in terms of each organization, whether they're effective, um, efficient, also we look at their leadership, especially the board, um, working with their senior leadership, um, but they all must now be working on some type of intergenerational solutions. And for those organizations who do not have any components dealing with inter intergenerational solutions, we're inviting them to think outside their box to see if they already have some existing programs that may have potential to expand into this region because we do not want to force everybody, all our past grantees, to move into this direction just because we have decided this. So we have been receiving many emails and phone calls and inquiries about what it means for them, especially some of the organizations that we've been funding for so many years. Um, and some of them have been successful and in transitioning smoothly into the new direction um, as they are piloting few new programs. Um, for example, many of the organizations are now looking to bring older adults, volunteers, uh, mentors to some of their youth programs. 
Um, also, some of the senior programs are also looking into reaching out to local college campuses or high school campuses to get some volunteers to volunteer at what, what, whichever site that they're at and also to encourage more participation in multi-generational um, way to bring all families together to do gardening projects or cooking classes or some of the cleanup projects throughout the region. And we have, um, if you look at our how to apply, we have also moved into online letter of inquiry process. So it will be easier for people to go in and apply without having to um, go through so much paper and will also be more efficient in terms of their time. We're currently also looking for new nominations for this year's Eisner Prize, which will be presented next, early next year at Encore.org's um, conference. And if you are curious about some of the recent grants that we have made since the launch in July this year, if they're all listed under recent grants, and you will see a variety of programs, whether it be for foster youth, arts program, early education, um, some of the senior programs that are already in place, how they were able to be innovative in bringing multiple generations into their program. So at this time, I would like to turn it back to Maria, and I could ask more. I could answer more questions in specific to our grant making. Thank you so much, Kathy. And again, I invite um, all those who are joining us today, if you have any questions for any of our presenters, to please use the uh, question box on your screen that you'll see on the right. Um, at this time, we'll move on to um, some of the questions that have been submitted so far. And the first question is for either uh, Sherry or Emily at Generations United. Um, one question from a couple of the participants today are, what are the criteria um, that you use to identify the best intergenerational communities um, for those awards? Um, hi, this is Sherry from Generations United. Um, what we've done is over the course of a, a couple of years has developed an application that really um, what we're hoping and what we've seen so far is really um, applicable across different communities. We are trying to really go down to sort of some general information about, um, about communities um, that could be cross-cutting, whether you're as large as San Diego County or as small as Itabena, Mississippi. Um, what we ask for folks is sort of to explain what their communities are doing for older and for younger people, um, to discuss sort of in programs and practices, to provide some demographic uh, data about their communities. Um, we're looking at each community individually based on their capacity so that you don't have to be um, a community with a ton of resources to be able to sort of strive to do quality intergenerational intergenerational work. Um, and what we found through the process is that there has been, again, this wide uh, diversity of programming of um, communities in terms of geographic location and size and what, what the communities look like, all doing just different types of um, innovative intergenerational work, looking at ways to bring the generations together. What I will add is, you know, what we, what our reviewers are looking at, and we've had in a number of cases, um, folks that will spend a lot of time talking about, um, you know, what, what a community is doing for um, its aging population, for its older adult population, with not quite so much focus on the young. And as Donna was mentioning early, we're really looking for that recipro the reciprocity, the reciprocity, uh, let me get that word out, um, as, as well as sort of that, that interaction, um, the intentionality of bringing together both younger and older people. Some of our finalists have, our national finalists, they've had some ex excellent um, initiatives started, but haven't quite taken it to the, the young, the youth perspective, and we've seen communities that since they've applied, developing a more, a stronger focus on how to get youth engaged, how to com connect the generations, um, get youth involvement in their um, aging community work that they're doing. So there's some steps that uh, folks are taking to get to that process. I'm not sure if I answered. Emily, did you have anything else to add? Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, the next question is for uh, Ellen. And there's a question from a couple um, participants on the um, 
program, working with uh, foster children who age out of the program, and the life skills um, coaches. And the question um, is in regards to how long do those coaches um, work with the youth? Um, and um, what type of screening process do you, do you use um, with regards to the mentors for that program? Thank you so much for asking. You know, the, um, the individual, the life skills coach, may wish to mentor numerous youth. Some of the people that come into the program, and I can think of a superstar, Vicki Velasco, who was our health promotion champion for years. I've lost track of the number of youth she's mentored. She never gives up anybody. She just brings more people in as her mentees. These are county uh, positions. The youth are screened through our county process. The life skills coaches receive background checks. Before they can work with the youth and in the program, we do need to screen them carefully, and we do. So the actual uh, time commitment is six months. It's for the uh, period of time in which the youth is a, is a formal part of our county system. So six months, but then again, many uh, choose to continue. Thank you, Ellen. And a follow-up uh, question to that is um, in regards to any um, training that are, are there trainings um, provided by uh, perhaps local businesses um, in the county to um, supplement the program or to supplement the um, life skills uh, coaching that the uh, youth receive? Yes, there is. They do have both a life uh, coach skills training from the older adult. They also have a job mentor and a job coach at the actual job site. So when we have uh, way students here, I'll just use our aging and independent services, they have a cadre of people that are supporting that youth here in our office. So they have the individual that's assigned to be their formal job mentor, and then they have any number of other team members that are helping uh, informally coach them on the nuances of working in a team. How do you get along with your peers? What's the etiquette in the office? So it is focused within the county family, within the county structure. Um, I don't believe quite as much occurs externally, but there are liaisons with the individual school if they happen to still be in, in school. Uh, they do need to be 18, but some of them are still in school. Uh, the other thing is that we do a lot of support uh, opportunities for the life skills coach and the job coaches. They meet they have regular reflection, reflecting series that go on. They meet um, on a regular basis and go over key issues that both arise with those youth as well as things that could arise. So we try to provide all three um, members of the team, the youth, the job skills coach, and the life skills coach, with as much support as we can to make this partnership work. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, a question for Kathy. Um, with regards to um, your new focus now on intergenerational, what are the um, successful uh, first steps in um, an organization transitioning from, say, traditional program just focused on older adults to including intergenerational work? What are some of the successes that you've seen so far? Um, somewhat from specifically for senior groups? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it seems that the, many of the senior groups that we have seen in L.A., um, they already have a significant number of volunteers who are young adults or um, young um, groups that that serve both children and seniors. And I think in order to be more realistic about expansion, I think they really need to look at their community that they're placed in, um, whether, whether there'll be, there's other caretakers or other groups that may involve younger generations and then go from there. Um, we don't encourage people to go and find someone who's not familiar with the community, who's not familiar with the population, um, just to create a whole new program just to qualify for our funding. But 
we, we've seen so many models where there's um, um, community colleges or high schools or universities that are around where they may be able to um, do some field work as well as some volunteer opportunities in some of the senior centers, some of the healthcare centers, um, where they can not only serve the seniors, but also seniors can also be examples for them as, as mentors, as just as their um, friends who have wisdom to share with some of the young adults. Um, and in return, they're not just only benefiting each other, but benefiting the entire community, where they can take up on various different um, volunteer projects together. Um, and, and we've seen so many studies that shows that the aging process actually slows down when they're when when older adults are engaging in different activities with young adults, as well as um, young adults are able to, many of, many of the young adults in um, LA region, especially the youth, they don't have grandparents or other older role models in their lives. So it just benefits for both communities. So we have, for the organizations who are struggling to figure out how to launch this, we actually have, I forgot to mention, we actually We'll be holding a convening, a training session um, in late November. Actually, we're inviting um, Generations United and several other speakers throughout the country to come out and talk about some of the best practices and solutions that they have seen where they could easily try to launch and do a pilot project in LA. So it's an ongoing process. It's a work in progress. And you know, we're also learning more and more um, different ways of applying this um, as we go through this. Um, but we are asking all the organizations to not rush into this, that it, it only makes sense in their program model um, that they should try this out. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I have a question um, for uh, Sherry or Emily um, with regards to the um, the notion of being um, intentional in your work. Um, Someone here has written in that uh, their community does a lot of innovative and collaborative uh, work for youth, um, and it seems natural to um, include um, working with older adults in the community. Are there specific recommendations that you have um, for folding in an intention focus on making those intergenerational connections in a community? Um, so I guess to summarize, what sort of what are the first steps in um, making sure that you're intentional in your programming to add that intergenerational component? Um, great question, and I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that, that someone asked it. I think you know, Donna start, mentioned that you know, when we're looking at something intentional, a lot of it is actually having the um, input of the generations that you want to be serving. So what we encourage a lot of communities, and it, it has worked in a number of communities, is to think about some type of intergenerational task force or planning commission, um, planning committee, even a committee. It doesn't have to be a formal commission. Um, but a group that engages uh, older people, younger people, key stakeholders in a way where they can talk and discuss and think about what makes sense, um, what the community is already doing, how they can start to infuse different intergenerational strategy, strategies in the work that they're doing, and possibly planning for some new activities that might even be intentionally and intergenerational. So we've worked with communities that have gone from the senior side, where they may already have a, um, some type of uh, co a consumer aging group where you actually have representatives from the community, and they've looked to engage and expand by having uh, representatives from uh, organizations serving children and youth as well as young people uh, present. So I think it works the other way as well, is if you have a group um, an internet, uh, a group that's, uh, who's the planning committee for the youth work to think about ways to expand to include both stakeholders from aging services as well as older adults themselves. And what we also recommend to folks do is that making sure that commission is truly, or that committee, that group is truly intergenerational, that it's not dominated by one generation or the other, that everyone's treated equally um, establishing some ground rules from, from the beginning, um, as well as building community within that group that can really sort of be a microcosm for uh, what you can then do in the larger community. You get the buy-in from stakeholders, including younger and older people themselves, 
Um, if you're looking at engaging much younger children, you know, making sure that there's parents of young children that are in, involved in the group, as well as, as appropriate, um, you know, people of, people of you know, whatever age is going to be serving. Um, from there, you know, that's what ideas come out that, um, that really work, that people want to participate in, where Donna used the example of the, the, the multi-generational center that created their high school technology program. Um, for that example that failed, we have countless examples of youth-led intergenerational technology programs where they're teaching older adults, um, that they're teaching older adult te technology skills, which have been developed by the youth themselves. They've engaged and recruited their friends and have had really successful outcomes in doing that. So it's as much the intentional, I think, is really that getting that buy-in and getting the involvement from the beginning. You know, it's not that if you build it, they will come kind of mentality. It's really, you know, it needs to be built by the people participating. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, we have time for one last question, and this question is for Ellen uh, with regards to the Fit for Five um, wellness program. And the participant is asking if you have um, been measuring or have impact measures on, outcome measures on the number of pounds lost, lower incidence of diabetes. Um, so are you tracking at this point, and have you tracked, and what are the outcomes, if you have, um, on the wellness program for both the youth and older adults? You know, this is Ellen. I'm really glad you asked me that because it gives, you, it gives me an opportunity to just say something about outcomes and intergenerational work. That has been uh, uh, something of great importance to us on the journey is to try to demonstrate the evidence and why we feel that these programs are so important and make such a difference. So, yes. We are in the midst of engaging a, an evaluator for our Five and Fit program. And we, I was just checking on this earlier this week to see if we have some preliminary results. We do not have them yet, but we will have them shortly. And with them, we will return to our funder, First Five Commission, to demonstrate the value and to advocate for continuance and expansion of the program into other preschools that they support. So yes, we in this day and age of evidence-based practices, we totally are on board with trying to demonstrate that with our intergenerational programs. I think you can see that in our presentation where, for example, at San Pasquale, we do show the graduation rate of the youth in comparison to their peers that are not at the academy, not receiving intergenerational supports. So we are trying to build that evidence base for our future and for the future of IG efforts. Thank you, Ellen. At this time, I'd like to invite each of you to um, leave, um, leave any final thoughts or um, a main point that you would like all the participants to leave with with regards um, to in your work in intergener intergenerational solutions. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kathy first. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I would like to encourage other funders. I know that um, this webinar is for GI members, but I know several of the, we're also a GI member as well, but many of the foundations are also funding various children program and various other issue areas for you to consider looking into some of these investing in some of these intergenerational solutions uh, where there will be more multiplier effects and there will be more value to your investment um, for years on. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My contact info is on our website. And um, I look forward to more conversations as also for you to also look at our Eisner Prize. Um, tech section where we are still asking for nominations throughout the country. That's our, um, the national program that we have. So if you have any recommendations, feel free to also recommend um, and more information about our website. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ellen? Thank you. You know, I think one uh, point I would just like to make is how important it is for all of us to tell the story of intergenerational successes and work together to capture the hearts and minds of our future volunteers of all ages, as well as decision makers and funders, always returning to the meaning and purpose of the work we do, which is to remit 
the fabric of our society. That's really what we're working on. In the past, we didn't have to exert these conscious efforts. It happened naturally. But now it will take all of us to reweave that safety net and do so together with our, all of our generations. Thank you. And Sherry? Um, I was actually just going to ask if we could move the slide forward. I know we've discussed a lot around the inspiration of it, but I do want to share that there is how-to information out there. Um, the Generations United website, all of our resources are available for free at www. You can also, the shortcut is gu.org. Um, as well as the, there's the links to some of the other presenters today as well as some other resources that are out there for, for communities. So if you're inspired by what you've heard today, um, you want more information, we're all here available to help. We love talking about this. Um, we love helping people get their ideas off the ground. Um, and I think just the one thing that Donna did want to say, and I think Kathy um, said it well, is that there are many opportunities that funders can take to support intergenerational work. And we've seen success in, in a number of communities that have simply added a question um, on their application about um, intergenerational aspects. Are there intergenerational intergener um, aspects to this project? Have you thought of involving a younger or older generation in what you're doing, as well as asking questions on site visits, um, and just sort of kind of continuing to spark the interest, and then referring to the resources that are out there to, um, to make it happen. So we just really thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you so much. I want to thank Donna Butts, Executive Director at Generations United, as well as uh, Sherry and Emily from Gener Generations United who joined us today. Kathy Choi, Director of Programs at the Eisner Foundation, and Ellen Schmetting, Director of Aging and Independent Services, Public Administrator for San Diego County, for their participation in today's program. We thank you for all you do to make life better for older adults and youth. I also want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation for their continuing support of this program, as well as the American Society on Aging for their technical support for today's webinar. We will be making this presentation available to anyone who wishes to view it later. Uh, that in also includes the slides and the audio portion of today's uh, session. This will be made available on our website at giaging.org. I also want to remind the funders on our call today to be sure to register for GIA's annual conference coming up in Washington, D.C. from October 28th to the 30th and information and registration is available on our website. And finally, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Have a great day.